Hello everybody and welcome to Physiology Made Simple. Today we're going to talk about the ventilatory threshold concept and how it relates closely to the anaerobic threshold as well as the lactate threshold. Now let's get straight into it. What I've got on the whiteboard here is uh, some data sets which I'll explain in just a moment uh, and also various different exercise intensities. Now we're going to use an example of uh, an athlete who's gone out for a, a run and he's going to be changing his intensity during during the run and we will see how the ventilation changes and how it's related to the energy requirements uh, of the exercise. Now most of this data, in fact all of this data can be collected in a laboratory, in an exercise physiology laboratory. Uh, so we've got VO2 or oxygen consumption data uh, which can be taken in litres per minute and also the amount of carbon dioxide that uh, is expired um, can also be measured using Douglas bags uh, in an exercise physiology laboratory laboratory and we can then plot out the data uh, including ventilation. So we've got ventilation here in litres uh, per minute. So generally whenever we uh, uh, consume oxygen we're obviously going to be expiring uh, air out as, as, as uh, the process of metabolism takes place to try and get rid of the CO2. Now during exercise we will have an increase in CO2 and that will drive changes in ventilation which we'll talk about in just a moment. We can also take blood samples and measure blood lactate. Okay so what we have along here is uh, the blood lactate changing at various uh, intensities of exercise. Now I'm just going to uh, define these exercise intensities. So this is uh, a very light uh, intensity. So imagine um, an athlete has just started a very uh, low intensity jog. So he's just started to uh, to run. It's a very easy pace. Uh, he will then eventually progress to uh, a moderate intensity pace when he will increase the intensity some moments into the run uh, and that will incur some metabolic changes uh, and then of course the last stage is uh, high intensity uh, this is a this is a, a intensity which the uh, runner can only uh, sustain for a short amount of time because it will result in an increase in lactate now let's have a look about let's have a look at the ventilatory threshold now in a light intensity uh, activity, such as a light run or a light jog, you will see that lactate levels um, remain quite similar to rest. So th this is a uh, resting period here, okay, uh, and the lactate levels remain quite similar. What we also see is that the muscle contraction will require ATP. Now that ATP is going to be supplied by uh, oxidative phosphorylation. Okay, so I'm just going to put ox and then I'm going to put phosphorylation. Okay, so this is basically phosphorylation. We should be able to fit that across here. Oxidative phosphorylation to produce ATP uh, in this very light intensity running stage. So um, oxidative phosphorylation is an aerobic energy source. Okay, uh, and essentially what's happening is we need to have oxygen going into the muscle, into the mitochondria to produce the ATP and there is some CO2 which is also being produced uh, by, by the, uh, the muscle tissue which is then being buffered away by bicarbonate towards the lung. Now what we can see is ventilation is matching um, the, the need to blow off or breathe out CO2 but also the need for oxygen to get into the tissues for this process to, to occur. Now, generally we call this uh, point, if I use my black point here, um, you know, the ventilatory threshold occurs later on, but we, we, we see that as we go into a moderate intensity, we, we will start to see the next phase of the increase in, in these parameters. So this is generally known as VT1. Uh, when the ventilatory threshold occurs around about here, this is known as VT2. And we'll speak a little bit more when we get to that stage. Now, the runner decides to uh, increase the tempo of his run, or he may encounter a slight incline. So his muscles are now working harder. Now what happens in this uh, phase is that we're still using oxidative phosphorylation to produce ATP but we start to we start to rely a little bit upon glycolysis. 
Now, anybody that knows about glycolysis knows that it, it, it's a predominantly uh, anaerobic energy um, uh, source. Okay, so it produces en energy without the need for uh, for oxygen. It also produces high amounts of CO2. Okay, so as we uh, start to rely more upon glycolysis, our CO2 production. Uh, increases. Okay, and these are being detected by chemoreceptors located uh, in different parts of the body, sending signals back to the brain. Now, glycolysis and oxidative phosphorylation both make a contribution to the ATP at moderate intensity, um, but we can see that ventilation, VO2, VCO2 are still quite closely matched. Okay, so ventilation is matching the need to blow off the CO2, breathe out the CO2 and consume the oxygen. But what we are seeing is an increase in the lactate, blood lactate levels. And of course, when lactate increases, we also get an increase in, in hydrogen ions as well. This can start to increase the acidity within the muscle tissue. So uh, lactate starts to increase. Now, it's an important point that I need to make here. Lactate increases, uh, but we're in, a, we're in what's called a lactate accommodation zone, okay? So the muscle tissue can actually tolerate that lactate. So whereas this is a, a, a situation, this is a condition where you've got low lactate, uh, here the lactate can be accommodated. What that means is that the lactate that's being produced by the muscle tissue as a result of some reliance on glycolysis is being cleared away, okay? So that lactate is being cleared away, it's not being uh, built up, okay? And it's not causing any uh, acidosis or major acidosis, which will eventually go on to inhibit uh, muscle action. So this is what's happening at moderate intensity phase. We then, for the last two to three minutes of the jog, the box, the athlete, I was going to say boxer, boxers do a lot of running. Uh, the athlete uh, is about to um, really push really hard. He's going to increase uh, the intensity, go as hard as he can for the last two to three minutes. And we all know it, when we breathe, when we run fast or we, we perform close to our maximum intensity, we start to breathe harder. And why is that happening? It's because we're starting to get a greater reliance upon anaerobic glycolysis to the point where in the high intensity phase glycolysis is the major source of ATP okay glycolysis is the major source of uh, ATP so we're having no hardly any reliance on oxidative phosphorylation and what that means is that whenever we we rely completely on glycolysis our CO2 levels are going to go through the roof. I'm going to put two arrows here just to highlight the fact that CO2 levels are going to increase uh, dramatically uh, due to the, because it's a waste product uh, or it's a byproduct of, of glycolysis. So we have an increase in CO2. Now at the same time we have an increase in blood lactate levels as well. They increase quite rapidly uh, and, and they're also going up towards um, a, a level which would deem the individual to have significant acidosis. Uh, enzymes would stop working uh, or they wouldn't work effectively and muscle contraction then stops which results in uh, fatigue and we, and we stop the exercise. Now what's happening with the ventilation is that at this point here, which is known as VT2, okay, let's make a note of that. At this point here, I've already actually made a note here, but VT2, we're actually seeing a greater production of CO2 because we rely relying upon glycolysis. And what happens at the ventilatory threshold is that our ventilation starts to uh, disproportionately rise to the oxygen consumption. So up to this point, the, the ventilation was matching the requi oxygen requirement and it was breathing off the CO2. Now we're relying upon glycolysis. We're producing much more CO2. The chemoreceptors have detected that. They've sent a signal to the respiratory centers in the brain and we now start to breathe. Uh, our ventilation increases. We start to breathe much harder. Uh, and, we're, and the reason for that is we're trying to blow off that CO2. Okay, we're trying to get rid of that CO2. And if anything, this is such an effective method that if we were to map out the uh, ventilatory equivalent of, uh, uh, CO, uh, of uh, VCO2, we'd actually start to see VCO2 levels start to d decline, okay? Because ventilation is so effective at blowing off that or breathing out that excess CO2 that's produced. Now, at this point, and I'll get another colored pen here, this point is also known uh, so we, we talk about this VT2 point as the ventilatory threshold. This is the point 
um, where ventilation changes to match the need to get rid of CO2 and no longer reflects the, uh, the, the oxygen consumption. Okay? It's also known as the anaerobic threshold as well okay? because the change in ventilation has happened because we're now relying upon an anaerobic energy source, the glycolysis. Okay? So ventilatory threshold and anaerobic threshold are terms that are often used interchangeably uh, and that's not surprising uh, because you know, they're, they're reflecting very similar uh, mechanisms, they're reflecting very similar metabolic changes that are happening as a result of going from a moderate to a high intensity uh, exercise level. Okay, ventilatory threshold and anaerobic threshold. Now, we also have another term that you'll see in textbooks or you'll see coaches or athletes or people in the gym mention uh, or an athletics track is the lactate threshold. Okay, now the lactate threshold is also inter used interchangeably with ventilatory threshold or anaerobic threshold. Now we have to be cautious about the lactate threshold because lactate increase could also be as a result of reduced clearance. Okay, so there could be a re re um, there could be um, you know a normal consistent level of production, but that lactate's not being cleared well enough, so it accumulates, uh, and that's why we get an increase in the lactate rather than it reflecting increased production due to glycolysis. So that can happen. There is some disagreement in the literature about whether lactate threshold occurs at the same time as these two. However, by the time you're exercising at a high intensity, you know, you're pushing very hard, you're breathing deeply, you are very much relying upon glycolysis and that does result in a sharp increase in lactate levels. So the likelihood is that lactate threshold occurs very close to the ventilatory threshold, about either the same stage or within, within a stage of when the ventilatory threshold occurs if you were doing like an incremental exercise uh, test. So the lactate threshold uh, is also likely to be happening at the same time as the ventilatory threshold and anaerobic threshold which all occur around about this point here. Um, and of course if this continues then what's going to happen is the hydrogen ions are going to build up, they're going to inhibit enzyme activity uh, in the muscle, they stop acting and myosin from working correctly, and various other important enzyme metabolism and that will cause fatigue and that will cause us to, to stop. And all the while the brain is actually sensing all of these changes uh, you know, through information being sent by the chemoreceptors um, and is able to adjust the ventilation all the time uh, according to the amount of CO2 that's produced. So that really is the ventilatory threshold in uh, the simplest way that I can explain. Uh, if you click on for the next part, I'll actually explain to you briefly some approaches that you can actually take to, to train your anaerobic threshold because uh, for endurance performance, it's extremely important to, to develop this anaerobic threshold because what you want to do is you want to be able to increase this threshold to a point where you can exercise just under, under, under it so that you don't accumulate uh, excess amounts of lactate, sorry down here, excess amounts of lactate and fatigue. You want to be able to uh, make the anaerobic threshold uh, a, a little bit greater, shift the curve to the right almost, uh, and ensure that the anaerobic threshold occurs later, which means that you can you continue to use aerobic pathways for longer, which ultimately means that your endurance performance will improve. So that's gonna happen in the next part. I'd like to thank you for your time. Please do leave comments um, and feedback about any of this content, uh, and I'll hopefully see you again very soon.